for just some general Zoom info, um, keep your mics off, um, cameras on if you're comfortable. Um, we will have some breakout rooms, so you all use your mic um, during that time if you're able um, so that you can have some conversations with a couple other folks. Um, and then re turn your mics back off whenever we return to the large group. Um, we do have closed captioning available for this session. There should be a closed captioning icon where you can turn it on. Um, and finally, you can use the chat to DM Blaze Bush um, if you have any questions that come up. Blaze is going to be just monitoring the chat for us. Um, we have a link here, the tiny URL um, for the UFL drive. That is a Google Drive that will have um, CEU information, a copy of our presentation, um, some resources, and the link to our evaluation. Um, and we'll be sharing that again at the end of the session. Um, let's see. Let's see, in the, in the CEU stuff, um, there is a welcome letter that will have um, this link that's on this slide and the code, which you will need to um, get your CEUs. Um, nursing folks will also have to complete an additional form that is in that folder as well. So this session is part of the LGBTQ plus affirming healthcare series. Um, we provide affirming education, applicable skills, and best practices needed to advocate for and improve the health outcomes for LGBTQ plus patients. Um, after today, our next session will be in October. It'll be the Black Lives Matter, a call to action for healthcare. Registration is available at that link, um, and it's also available on our Google Drive. So about us, I'll let Aaron introduce themselves. Yes, hey everybody, how's everyone doing today? My name is Aaron Weathers. I use the pronouns he and they um, interchangeably. Uh, I am a Southern, um, I'm a Southern Black queer, uh, able-bodied, uh, neuroadaptive. Um, what neuroadaptive means to me is um, I'm someone that who has uh, lived with um, depression and anxiety, PTSD, but um, uh, it's a terminology that's also saying that, that I have adapted necessarily to uh, adversity and to my, my surroundings and my environment. Um, I also identify as a scholar and an activist. Um, and uh, that's, that's me. I'm the, uh, I work in the LGBT scene. I'll pass it on to you, Goldie. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I'm Goldie. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm a white, fat, able-bodied, neurodivergent, queer, non-binary, trans femme, visionary, and healer. Um, we'll explore some of these terms today and some of them, you know, it's just part of the wonderful mystery of who I am. And you can just learn more about me as we continue on this journey together. Yes. So, uh, so today we're gonna just talk about um, our intentions. So, uh, Gody and I, when uh, uh, coming up and collaborating on this uh, this presentation, we had some certain we had some intentions that we wanted to set forth uh, before we start the presentation. Um, uh, the first one is we definitely want to interrogate how we have come to understand our identity. Um, so we uh, a lot of times we take our identities for granted, especially those who have privileged identities. So uh, we definitely want to interrogate uh, how we come to understand our own identities. Uh, the second one is we want to challenge our preconceived beliefs and taking for granted norms. Uh, because what we notice is that the dominant, um, the dominant identities usually uh, are the ones that we take for granted, and those are the ones with privilege, while those that are marginalized, uh, we learn, um, see the world from a different point of view. So we definitely want to challenge these uh, preconceived beliefs. Uh, the third thing is we want to energize folks. I am a big nerd, and I want to energize folks to become agents of their own learning. Um, so like definitely, we want to uh, energize folks to take after this to learn even more about identities um, and um, ways to look at identity. And the last one is we wanna mobilize us to interrogate these concepts into our work and everyday lives. So we don't wanna just leave it here, teach it and leave it here. We want you to be able to take this and apply this into your schooling as well as into your healthcare practices every day. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna start with a quote by Kimberly Crenshaw. Self-interrogation is a good place to start. 
If you see inequality as a them problem or an unfortunate other problem, that is the problem. Being able to attend to, and not just unfair exclusion, but also frankly unearned inclusion is part of the equality gambit. We've got to be open to looking at all of the ways our systems reproduce these inequalities, and that includes the privileges as well as the harms. Um, so like I said, this is a quote by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, she is an attorney, advocate, and scholar who coined the term intersectionality, which is part of our title today. Um, Aaron found this quote when we first started creating this session, and I think it perfectly describes what our focus is today. I have reason to believe that all of you have joined us today because you are passionate about providing the best care and advocacy that you can. And the first step to being able to do that is for all of us to interrogate the biases and privileges that exist within us. So if you don't know the term intersectionality, it's an analysis related to identity that was first coined in 1989. We all have multiple identities. And within all of these identities, there exist systems of hierarchy, such as white supremacy, the patriarchy, et cetera. The combinations of our different identities or the intersections, hence intersectionality, affect the experiences we have in life. Some identities give us a leg up while others push us down. There are probably endless different combinations of identities that can compound the harm or advantage that we have in the world. We have to examine the different combinations of privilege and vulnerability to truly understand someone's experience. To use myself as an example, I'm white and I'm trans. Me being white doesn't mean I have always had it easy, but it does mean that race has never been a factor used against me in life. At the same time, my transness can and has been used as a reason to discriminate and enact violence against me. Yet, when I look at the, the at least 26 trans people that have been murdered this year for being trans, almost all of them are black. Without using an intersectional lens, we deny the totality of people and how their unique identities impact their experience in our world. We'll be discussing intersectionality more in depth um, a little later. For now, let's talk about why it's crucial we are having these conversations. Um, so. I don't know how many memes and think pieces I've seen saying that 2020 is the worst year to ever happen. Um, here we have an example of a meme that was circulating a couple months ago. These two particular examples show Kerry Washington and Reese Witherspoon um, and how they have felt during each month of 2020. And like, I get it, 2020 has had so many disastrous moments. The pandemic has highlighted the horrible as impacts of systemic racism as black, indigenous, and Latinx people die at three to four times higher rates from COVID than white people. The murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many black folks at the hands of police, uh, at the hands of police sparked international ongoing protests against police brutality and systemic racism. Right now, we're seeing devastating wildfires on the West Coast with skies and landscapes that look like they're out of an apocalyptic movie. Yet before colonization, indigenous tribes would practice controlled burns to get rid of the underbrush, cultivating the land and preventing wildfire, wildfires. Now, climate change has made all of those areas even more fire prone, and the government is seeking the indigenous wisdom it banned a long time ago. Just two days ago, we got news from an ICE whistleblower, which is the, immig the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, that one of the ICE facilities in Georgia is carrying on the United States tradition of eugenics by performing mass hysterectomies on people detained there. All of these disasters and so many more are not just a string of bad luck. These issues are deeply rooted in our government, our healthcare, our school, and our society at large. I would love it if we could spend this hour solving systemic racism, ableism, homophobia, and all the other systems of power that are foundational to the institutions in our country. But the reality is, is that they are foundational to these very institutions. They were here before 2020 and they aren't going anywhere today or on January 1st. And I'm gonna take a moment to get a drink of water really fast. Um, so I want to acknowledge that living in the midst of all these tragedies is traumatic for all of us, but we have to acknowledge what is happening and where their roots are if we want to create new worlds free from these tragedies. Together, we have to rebuild the foundations that are working against the most marginalized in our communities, and that change begins in our most intimate relationships, including the one we have with ourselves.
We have to simultaneously interrogate what we've been taught while holding compassion that we did the best we could with what we had. But as we learn more, we have an obligation to use our knowledge for the betterment of our world. And so that leads me back to the quote by Kimberly Crenshaw. We have to self-interrogate. Inequality and oppression are not someone else's problem. Racism is tied to transphobia and it's tied to ableism. And that's why Aaron and I want to make an hour for us to be able to reflect on ourselves and how we've been taught to see the world. For some of you, this may be a brand new conversation. For others, you may have been on this journey for a while, but this journey is never ending. The beauty of life is that there is always change and we will continue to encounter new ways of thinking and being. We have to embrace change and critically reflect on how we impact our communities and our world. So today, Aaron and I are going to guide you on a self-reflection journey and introduce some ways of viewing the world that may be new. There is no way we can fully teach how to apply this to your healthcare work in an hour. And honestly, new policies and forms are only a part of the change, and it won't last if we don't do our own personal work of examining biases and privileges. All of us have been indoctrinated into this world and have absorbed toxic message messages in some capacity. It's a lot easier to look at someone different than us and wonder why they are the way they are than it is to question our own casual certainties. Everything we discuss will be applicable to our lives, both within healthcare and outside of it. Some of what we discuss may be difficult to hear, but I hope you'll be able to keep an open mind and join us on this journey. I can guarantee that you'll see ways that you can begin making changes to the way you interact with patients and everyone else in your community. Um, anything else you would like to add there, Aaron? No, I think that that uh, gets us started off on the right foot. Uh, thanks, I think I uh, summed it up pretty much good. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I wanted to start by examining gender. Um, we have some definitions on this slide. By no means is this list exhaustive, but it will at least introduce some simple terms that I have been using and will continue to use today. Um, we'll start with gender itself. Um, I still see cis people using sex and gender interchangeably. They aren't the same. Sex is what is assigned to infants at birth based on genitalia and some other biological characteristics. Gender, on the other hand, is our innermost concept of self, whether that be male, female, a blend of both, or neither. It's how we perceive ourselves and how we interact in the world. Because of the way Western society assigns sex to infants, the gender binary was born. The gender binary is a harmful system of viewing gender as consisting solely of two categories, male and female. The gender binary assumes no other genders or bodily differences exist and that it isn't possible for people's understanding of their gender to change. This has not been true throughout time and cultures though, but it is what has developed in Western science. And let's be clear, the gender binary is harmful for everyone, not just trans people. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. The important thing right now is to know that everyone has some concept of gender, even if it's the lack of gender. Um, so then we move on to trans. So people who are trans have a gender that differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. Conversely, cis people have a gender that matches the sex they were assigned at birth. The prefixes uh, for cis and trans are Latin, cis being this side of and trans being the other side of, which makes sense given the definitions of transgender and cisgender. So if you are not trans, you are cis. If you're just finding out that you're cis for the first time right now, congratulations. I am really honored to be on this journey with you. It's important we have language to describe all experiences, not just those that are marginalized. This helps to humanize marginalized people, in this case, trans people like me. Um, trans people may describe themselves using one or more of a wide variety of different terms. All of those different identities and experiences are under the trans umbrella, which is why we say it is an umbrella term. Some people under the trans umbrella may identify as non-binary. Non-binary refers to someone who has a gender outside of the gender binary of male and female. To clarify, non-binary is not a third gender. It's an entirely, it's just the, like, it's for people who do not like fall into those boxes and don't want to be boxed in. What non-binary means to me is likely very different than what it means to someone else. And others who fit this definition may use other terms to describe their gender, which means that non-binary is also considered an umbrella term. 
So using these definitions, we can see that non-binary people are trans. Um, that's because non-binary people have a gender that is different from the sex they were assigned at birth. Some non-binary people may describe themselves as trans and some may not. What's important is that you're reflecting the language that they are using to describe themselves. Um, if all this new information is new for you, it may seem like a lot, but I hope you are still here with me. Um, kind of the takeaways is it's important that we all to know that we all have some sense of gender and that some people are trans and others are cis. Um, moving on to pronouns. So pronouns are how we refer to each other in the third person. We're taught about he, she, and they pronouns in elementary school. Many non-binary people use a singular they as their pronoun because it doesn't have implications of gender. Others may use other pronouns, including he, him, she, her, z, here, or any, something else entirely. I happen to be one of the non-binary people who uses they, them pronouns. So as an example, when you leave the session, you may say, they are so funny, incredible, and awe-inspiring. Or I have to ask them where they got their hair done. Um, so it's important to never assume the pronouns someone uses. Learning new pronouns takes time and daily practice but it's important and honestly life-saving work. Some trans people, myself included, have harmful histories with certain pronouns. Using any other pronouns than aren't they, them for when referring to me is not acceptable. Not respecting a trans person's pronouns, names, or their experience is a form of violence against them. It's always best to defer to using they, them until you find out uh, someone's pronouns so that you aren't making assumptions. And do this for everyone, not just people that you suspect are trans. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of time to spend on pronouns today, um, but there are resources we will share, like in our Google Drive, as well as countless other ones online that go into more depth about pronouns. Um, the last thing I'll say for today is that language is dynamic and evolves throughout space and time, so we can better communicate with each other. We don't go around speaking in old English, we've adapted and evolved our language. This is why it may seem like we, as queer and trans people, are always creating new words and identities. The language that was there before failed us, so we transcended it and created something new that better describes our lived experiences. Um, so we're getting ready to get ready for our first breakout room. Um, we're gonna split you all up into groups of three to discuss the questions that are on this slide. Um, we're, me and Aaron are gonna model some of this for you first though. Um, so first, you'll introduce yourself using your name, pronouns, and why you joined the session today. So for me, my name's Goldie, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm here today because I know that our current systems are lacking and I want to create new worlds together with all of you. Um, you will then describe your gender using three words. Avoid gender stereotypes and words relating to the gender binary. This may seem like a really like foreign concept to a lot of you, but Aaron and I are gonna give you some words that we came up with to describe our genders. Yes, thank you. So um, so um, my name is Aaron and I came up with these three um, terms to describe my gender, uh, multidimensional, um, all encompassing and exquisite. Uh, Cause I think it's just really something special and beautiful. Um, but I think that my gender, even though uh, aesthetically, um, it's, it appears very masculine uh, in, ter in, in aesthetics, but I think that uh, in my performance, it's, it's very much both in all genders. Uh, so I think it's outside of the, the spectrum of the binary. Uh, so that's what I use these terms to kind of describe my gender. But exquisite is like my favorite one of the, the, the three of them, though. That's my favorite of yours, too. Oh, thank you. Um, for me, the first two words I chose are pretty simple. So I'm radiant. My gender is like a sun and, or a star for people. It's a bright glowing light that helps people feel warm and seen and at the same time shimmering in my own glory too. I'm like my gender is electric. It has a dynamic sharpness that is electrifying and stimulating. And then finally, it's emergent. So I owe this term to Adrienne Marie Brown, author of Emergent Strategy. Emergence is the way my complex gender arises and is shaped by not only the environment, but the people around me, but also by my own self. So I have a caterpillar on this screen because they are a great example of emergence. They may not see flight in their future, but it is inevitable. 
I didn't always see this path of gender for myself as a child, but I didn't end up here by chance. My life has been changed and shaped by all of my experiences, and I have shaped and changed the world too. And my gender will continue to evolve and grow into, two, into new horizons that I can't even fathom at this time. So back to the breakout room questions. Um, after you use your, pick your three words, you will explain why you picked the words that you did, discuss how easy or hard the exercise was, and reflect on how your upbringing, culture, and learned stereotypes shaped your answer. Um, so like I said at the beginning, please use your mic during the session to talk with your group if you're able. Make sure you don't stay on the introductions too long, because you only have about two minutes per person to answer these questions. Um, whenever we reconvene, we'll have a question up on the screen and ask that y'all answer it in the chat. Um, so let's get started. And Blaze is going to be getting the breakout room, so give him just a moment. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, Amanda and Jacinta? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you all? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. Um, doing good. How are about yourselves? Doing I am well. dissertating. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm wearing pants. That's as far as I got. <laughs> 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 Well, congratulations on dissertating, though. That's awesome. I, I'm, I'm trying to tell myself that. We're just not there yet. <laughs> but otherwise, I'm breathing. I ate. I remember deodorant. We're good. <laughs> We're hanging in there. <laughs> I feel you on that. Definitely. So uh, what do you all think about this, um, this, uh, this exercise? Uh, what are the three terms that you all thought to describe your all's gender without necessarily using gender uh, stereotypes or gendered words? Uh, I mean, I realize that I don't think I can do that. And, I, and I'm not saying it because I don't want to do that. It's because, as I've always thought about my gender, I just happen to have generally used gender stereotypes. And not because I didn't think there were other options, but I, those work for me. I, I, so now I'm sort of like, okay, so am I not allowed to do that anymore? Like, I, I guess that's something I sort of get lost on as I learn more about the expanded gender options for everyone. I want there to be options for everyone, but I also sometimes feel like now the options that I'm happy with for me are no longer okay. So I'm like, where did I go? <laughs> yeah. No, I Oh, go ahead, Amanda. All right, no, that just, that resonates with me because the first thing that came to my mind was default. Like, I am a straight white woman, and that is the default assumption when mm -hmm. people look at me. I mean, I also, you know, in quarantine, I'm spending all of my time with my, like, 6'5 husband. So, you know, it's very, like, nuclear family. We have a daughter. Like, it's very 1950s, like, from the outside. Obviously, I'm here, so that's not, like, my worldview, but... That is the perception. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I think I think uh, I think with this activity too, it's just it. it I think that's the, it's its purpose is to like explode that like uh, the way that we think about it. Because I even told uh, Goldie when uh, they created it, I was like, look, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of stumped. I was like, I don't know how to describe uh, my own gender. Um, like I was thinking, uh, so what are some terms that uh, even even if you feel like they are the stereotypical or anything like that, what what would you all describe your genders as? I mean, I would go with girly. Yeah, I would say that. Like, when I think about myself, like, when people ask me, like, oh, as a woman, how do you describe yourself? That's what I would say, girly. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful, but <laughs> that's what I would say. I'm like, uh, huh. What about it, what about it do you uh, find to be girly? What about your gender I, to make you feel girly? I mean, I suppose that's really just more of, like, how I like to present myself to the world when I'm not at work. Like very much, it's very much an outside of work and school kind of thing. Like 
I often do hear that people are like, you know, I don't actually like, I didn't actually recognize you. And it's because I, I am very much in the stereotypical feminine space. I'm very much, you know, in the dress and the heels and the tights and the manicure. And it looks like I spent hours on my hair. I mean, and that's just, but that's something that I enjoy. And mm-hmm. so I would say, I mean, I mean, I leave the house, like before I leave the house, I'm just like, oh yes, girly. Okay, we're going. I, I mean, I have a shoe closet that like, you know, yes. rivaled the, you know, rivals anything really. In fact, that's what I use the tornado closet for to store shoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I, I, th- I think too uh, about this activity as well as, um, I think those are things that you can still uh, still identify with um, and, and be proud of that as well. I don't, I think it's, uh, is, is, is it necessarily, do we attach it with girly? Because I, um, I uh, have very much like um, mainly uh, women as friends, uh, cis women are my friends. Um, and I've always just kind of been like, they'll call me girl and all the time. Uh, but then you, you might see me uh, outside of work uh, in sweats. I like sweats. I'm a sweats and a tennis shoe type of uh, person. But then also too, there's moments um, where you might see uh, me, I'm very flamboyant. Flamboyant, mm-hmm. I guess, and people people would associate that with um, with I think girly girly as a, like a gender or um, also nurturing. Uh, my mm-hmm. like when I was a debate coach, I was seen as the mother of the team, uh, but that was just because I was the more nurturing of out of all the like coaches. So I think it's mm-hmm. uh, just in thinking of our gender in terms of like those uh, terms as well. Like, am I nurturing? Uh, when you were describing yourself, I was thinking, oh, that's fabulous, it's fierce, I love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's just thinking of our genders in terms outside of um, the norm of like, this is associated with, um, with women or girls, or this is associated with men or boys. Because um, we can all just perform uh, either or, you know, or both and. Yeah, I guess maybe, maybe part of what stumps me is I don't necessarily think of adjectives that maybe men would use for themselves that... I would apply to myself necessarily like maybe maybe that's part of the problem and, and maybe that's okay it's just it's harder for me to think outside of like that lens of oh girly like these things but I also like those things <laughs> I'm like yeah. Oh, yeah I don't I don't know I don't think it's a problem before they they zoop us out of the room I don't think it's a problem at all either I think that, that that's your identity and that's your gender and I think that that's the beautiful thing about us we all have different things but uh just the activity just to get us to think about it outside mm-hmm. of like the, the, that realm is just what mm-hmm. is the good part of it. But I think don't ever see it as a problem because if that is you, that is you and that's beautiful, you know? And I think as well yeah. as for you, Amanda, too. So don't ever like think that's a problem just because of this. Like that's our identity. I think it's just, we have so many gender identities. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um. So what came up for people in this activity? Um, And if you want, you know, just quickly type whatever first comes to mind in the chat. And I think Aaron is just gonna monitor that because I cannot see the chat while I'm sharing my screen. Yes, I have it up here pulled up. So I'll see what some folks are saying that kind of came up for them during this activity. And we're gonna try to go through these questions like pretty quickly. or these questions, so mm-hmm. yes, what is, what's coming up? Um, some folks, uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, remembering not being allowed to learn to play chess because I was born mm-hmm. female. Um, so definitely uh, the gender roles that um, what allow, what they, uh, that we were assigned at birth, like what does that allow us to do? Um, I also see it was difficult describing my gender using non-stereotypical terms. Um, that was something that also came up in my group as well. Um, uh, clueless, uh, how to pick the words um, is something else. Um, Kelly wrote, the conversation uh, was easy. Uh, oops, oops, my thing is going fast. <laughs> the conversation was easy. Go, uh, staying away from the, S- the stereotypes was difficult. Um, and it, it was a very, it seems like it was kind of difficult for folks to kind of find the words to describe their gender outside of the stereotypical um, things that we're uh, associated with genders. A lot of the terms, is, a lot of things coming up for this activity. Yeah, and I think that's part of it. I've had this conversation with my group is that, you know, like we are just taught or told who we are whenever we're born and we just grow up and we're just like we're told to accept that about ourselves. And so we don't, for so many of us, we don't ever have a chance to critically like examine our gender. Um, 
or we don't even like realize that's a possibility and that we get to write our own narratives. Absolutely. Um, the next question. So how does reflecting on your gender relate to supporting people in healthcare? And go. Let's see. All right, we have one. Um, so uh, Jessica mentioned uh, learning how to be compassionate about people's journey um, and finding themselves. So definitely uh, building mm -hmm. up that compassion. Um, Caroline mentions uh, reflecting on uh, your gender may help you better understand that gender is dynamic and other people will have their own personal understandings. Um, it's really good. Uh, let's see, sorry, they keep popping up. Another one uh, we have uh, from Heather is uh, to realize that everyone's perception of their self is different and to respect and honor that with compassion. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah. I definitely think that the key of the, the theme of compassionate care is definitely one mm -hmm. that's coming up a lot. Um, as well as Megan wrote, uh, recognizing that, different, that the different qualities and characteristics uh, one values in one's uh, self varies greatly. So definitely like not even taking uh, what we have for granted. Um, what we, what we value and it could be different than somebody else and that still matters just as much. Yeah. And oh, I, I saw one that I really liked. Uh, ask, and it was something that we also talked about in the last, in the last session that Blaze mentioned, was uh, ask, don't assume. Use broad mm -hmm. terms and allow individuals to self-identify. Yes. And that session, if you did miss it, um, will be on YouTube soon. Um, so you'll be able to go back and watch it and see Blaze talk so eloquently. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we're gonna keep moving. Um, so this is a Alok Vedmanen on the screen. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I chose this quote by Alok. Um, so as trans people, the world tells us that we have to conform and to hide if we want beauty and safety. And so that's why I think this quote is so powerful, because it's a quote that I think about every single day. The days that I feel most beautiful are the days that I feel the most afraid. So Alok is a trans performance, art, performance artist, poet, and author. Um, every day that I leave the house, I have to make the choice between my own authenticity and safety. I experience street harassment regardless of what I'm wearing because people can still pick up on my transness. If I'm wearing more bold or femme clothing like I am today, pieces that I feel so much more alive and real in, it gets much worse. Reading and listening to Elok's work over the last few years has been an important and healing part of my journey. They speak so passionately and authentically, and it breaks my heart when I see the amount of harassment they receive, both online and on the streets. But to watch other trans people live their lives so truly, so freely, I don't know anything that is more powerful. It reminds me that I'm not alone in, on this journey across the worlds of genders. And I say worlds plural for a reason. So the way I view gender is like space. If man and woman are two planets, think of the infinite number of other planets, stars, asteroids, and whatever, whatever else is out there. Man and woman are not in opposition to each other. Man is so much more than not woman, and woman is so much more than not man. And at the same time, there are so many other options too. I love how my own gender has evolved and grown over time in my own understanding of it, how it's shaped by my loved ones and, and shapes them in return. As we grow to learn new things, it's okay if our identities shape and change. We're learning new things about ourselves and that's exciting. Why should I deny the world my beauty just because it's scared? Trans people are teaching the world what it means to live beyond these boxes, to imagine a world where we can all be who we are and where we get to make that decision for ourselves. And that's not to say that to be a man or a, to be a woman is bad, cis or trans. Some trans people are men and women. And maybe you make your own identity, um, your own identity of a woman into a spaceship and travel across the vast regions of gender and pick up souvenirs and ideas along the way. You don't have to be confined by what our world tells us what a woman is. It doesn't make you less of a woman. Only you can decide when that label no longer fits you 
And if that time comes, there's a whole community of people out here discovering ourselves too. So in our interrogation of gender, I want to imagine new worlds with all of you. Um, so we can't keep assuming that everyone is cis or straight until they say otherwise. We decide a sex for our children at birth, and with that label comes all of these boxes, expectations, and limits from the gender binary. We get filled with so much shame about our differences from a young age, and then spend the rest of our lives trying to disentangle ourselves from that shame. And I'm not just talking about queer and trans people. It's all of us. That's why we see misogyny, transphobia, and under other forms of gender-based violence. We learn to hate parts of ourselves that are different, and then we project that shame and hatred onto each other in order to maintain the status quo. It's a vicious cycle. We deserve to write our own narratives and not have to experience the shame inherent in our world so plagued by the gender binary. Our bodies and genders don't belong to the binary, they belong to us. In healthcare, we gatekeep life-saving, gender-affirming procedures. Trans people, I included, hear our doctors and other providers misgender us, purposefully or not. Referring to someone's genitalia as male or female is still a form of misgendering them. Why do we gender testosterone and estrogen? All of us produce these hormones at various levels. The two sexes, and the air quotations are intentional, are so much more similar than we're taught, and the lines are usually very blurred. The reality is, is that there are more than two sexes. Intersex people are part of our world too, and part of our community, and are so often erased by the medical establishment. Some of them are trans, and some of them are not, but we pretend like they're not here at all. In keeping with healthcare, we have to trust our patients, practice informed consent models to eliminate the barriers so many trans people face. When a trans person decides to pursue hormonal and surgical options, we are usually already well aware of the risks involved, but it's essential for our survival. As a provider, your job is to support your patient, make sure they are aware of the risks, and develop a plan to help them meet their transition goals, not to make them jump through hoops and fight for what they need. At the same time, not everyone has the same transition goals, and some people may not want to medically transition at all. And that's okay, that doesn't make anyone less trans. Um, we also have to stop assuming the gender of everyone that we meet. Let people assert or question their gender. Ask questions, be curious, but don't be invasive. If cis people are uncomfortable by you asking their gender or pronouns, take a minute to talk to them about it. By doing that, you're raising awareness, shifting norms, and helping trans people not be alone in this fight where our lives are so often on the line. When I say I'm non-binary and trans femme, that is a powerful statement. I'm not looking for your validation or approval. I'm giving it to myself. Me having hair on my face, in my body, or whatever other factors people try to use against me doesn't make me any less femme or any less of any gender. My facial hair is femme and an array of other genders because it belongs to me. It can't be confined into the boxes you try to put over it. I have always existed outside of the binary, even if I didn't have the language or nuanced understanding of myself to express it to the world. And at the same time, my gender is still evolving and words will never fully describe it. Our language will always be limited, but my gender is not. So continue taking the time to interrogate your own gender and assumptions so that you aren't projecting your biases, shame and misconceptions onto others. Interrogating your gender doesn't mean you're going to turn trans, but it might mean you discover new things about yourself, and that's amazing. Trans people are dying because of, the, because of a world that is threatened by our existence. Anti-trans legislation is on the rise, while so much of our community is already struggling to survive. We need everyone to have an investment in this fight, because it's not just about us, it's about creating communities in a world free of violence and oppression. So, here are some steps you can take today. And this is just the start. And remember, this journey will last a lifetime, but it's how we will break down these systems that are holding all of us hostage. Include your pronouns in your introductions when you meet people, in your bios, and your email signatures. Don't assume the gender of anyone. 
if you think someone may be trans, they might not be, and vice versa if you think someone is cis. If someone is pregnant, don't assume they're a woman, and if they have a beard, don't assume they're a man. These are lies taught to us by the gender binary. Let people voice who they are, and if they say, if they identify as a gender that you don't know, ask them what it means for them, or you can just Google it. And at the same time, don't gender objects and characteristics about people. Um, mirror the language that your patients use about their bodies, their lives, and their experiences. Speak out against the transphobic actions, language, policies, and forms in your workplace, your community, and your home. Take initiative to make changes in these areas so that trans people don't have to. Are your medical forms gendered? Do you have gendered dress codes in your workplace? How often is your patient forced to see their sex assigned at birth or dead names on their paperwork? There's only so much we can do in Kentucky to avoid those kinds of things as they relate to insurance, but you can make changes to your medical records so your patients aren't bombarded every time they come into your office. And accept that we all mess up. We're all at different stages of learning in a multitude of different realms. Most people will notice if you are trying when you apologize and correct yourself. That said, some people may still get mad when they have been misgendered for the 20th time that day. Their anger isn't really about you. It's about a world that fails them time and time again. Apologize, move on, and take steps so that you do better next time. We're all human. We just have to embrace that. Primary care providers are, are able to provide gender-affirming hormone therapy for their patients. Take time to learn the best practices so that you can offer this care to your trans patients if you are a primary care provider. Referring someone to an endocrinologist or another provider creates more barriers for your patient who has already had to face significant hurdles just to see you that day. Trust your patients and practice informed consent. And then finally, hire, listen, and follow the leadership of trans people. And I'm not claiming to have all the answers for how to change our world, but I do have some thoughts and some suggestions, um, and I'm committed to being on this journey with all of you. And so now we're going to move into, you know, not just looking at gender, but looking at the looking at people as a whole. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so now we're going to uh, talk about intersectionality, but uh, as I uh, get off to, before I start there, uh, just that, al that Alok quote, uh, the days that I feel most beautiful are the days that I feel most afraid. It was so powerful, um, and it definitely, uh, as a Black gay man, it also made me feel like uh, the days that I feel the most seen and I, I'm a lot visible, I feel uh, afraid as well. Uh, it, it could be even just my Blackness or my queerness uh, just being seen, uh, and it, it almost puts me, it, it feels like it almost makes me... Um, like a, a target uh, potentially because of uh, the oppression and our hostility and violence that we can expect, face because of identities. And I think when we talk about the LGBTQ plus community, um, we all, we, I definitely want to uh, put out there that like we're uh, as diverse as any other community. Uh, a lot of times in spaces I hear folks say the LGBT uh, community and black people. And it's like, well, what does that do for me as a black LGBTQ person? Like, I'm in both communities. So I, I just also just when we think about our, our, the community, uh, just really uh, refer to, we're not monolithic. We're not a homogenous thing. Uh, and definitely like representation tends to focus on like the dominant identities within the community, uh, which are tend to be a white cisgender gay men. But I definitely want everybody to know that we are folks of different races, uh, of different genders, of different sexual orientations, different abilities, um, and so forth and so forth. So as we talk about uh, identity, we need to understand that these, all these different identities are part of us. They intersect and overlap in, uh, with one another to construct a unique identity of who we are as a holistic person. Um, and intersectionality is really just a, view, a way of viewing and understanding our identities. Um, as we see like here, Crenshaw mentions that it's a lens or prism uh, for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality uh, often operate together and exacerbate each other. Um, so uh, particularly, um, if I looked at the inequality uh, faced uh, by, because of my like anti-blackness and uh, um, homophobia, um, there is a particular intersection there. I think there's also too, when Godi mentioned earlier, uh, all the violence against trans women, we look at the intersection of um, transphobia, uh, transphobia, anti-blackness, uh, mis misogynoir. noir. Um, that intersection right there is why that violence is so exacerbated. Um, because of uh, all the, the hatred and the marginalization of those uh, identities. 
um, particularly uh, intersectionality, they'll use identities as multiplicative rather than additive. So you can't just say for, uh, if we took my identity, you can't just say Southern plus Black plus queer equals Aaron. But Aaron is a Southern Black queer. So you can't just like necessarily subtract one of these identities out, but it, um, they, they interface and they affect each other as a whole. Um, we can go to the next slide. Ooh, thank you. Okay, uh, as we understand it, uh, identity as intersectional, um, it means that we have to recognize that this shapes our identities uh, and experiences on different levels. So there's a personal level, and these the personal level is like the beliefs and attitudes and actions of individuals that support and perpetuate our identity in conscious and, uh, and unconscious ways, as well as these systems of oppression in unconscious and unconscious as in conscious and unconscious ways. That was a tongue twister. Um, also, in an interpersonal level, um, our relationships and our relations uh, and interactions with each other um, on an institutional level, these are like the discriminatory treatments, uh, unfair policies, and biased practices uh, that you might see uh, that are resulting in inequitable outcomes uh, that affect our like healthcare system, for instance. And then lastly, a structural. And this accounts for just the overarching uh, bias across institutions and, and society. Uh, so this definitely affects me on different levels, and they uh, influence each other. Um, also, when we're understanding identity as intersectional, it means that we need to take into account how different identities relate to power, um, how they relate to privilege, uh, oppression, and discrimination. Um, uh, when we talk about, when we discuss privilege, um, Peggy McIntosh, in Unpacking the uh, Invisible Knapsack, described privilege as an, un, an, as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but uh, about which I was meant to remain oblivious. Like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. Privilege can protect those from, uh, uh, from many kinds of hostility, distress, and violence, and they do not see how these systems affect them without examination of their daily experience. Um, we can experience privilege uh, for uh, race. So there is, uh, there's white privilege. Uh, necessarily, you don't think about um, your race on a day-to-day -day basis. There's also gender privilege. There's male privilege. Uh, there's cisgender privilege. There is uh, straight privilege. Uh, one of the ways that I um, always see um, like a heterosexual like that straight privilege is when someone asks me uh, about my partner, and they usually ask uh, if I have a wife or a girlfriend, and what's their name? And then I'll usually like, I try to be funny with them. I'll be like, oh, you know, their name is John, you know what I'm saying? Um, and just trying to throw them off. But like, there is these moments like that uh, where people automatically assume that this is the norm. And I think that's what the assumption of privilege is, is that this is the norm, this is the baseline, this is the standard, and then we're all else uh, different. Uh, and that's how folks gain that privilege from it. Um, and then lastly, uh, for, to understand our identities as intersectional, we need to acknowledge the aspects of identity that are historical. Um, so our, I, our identities are an expression of the time of history that we're in, but we're also influenced by the history of the past. Um, so for instance, in the healthcare field, um, when I think about the mistreatment of black folks in the uh, in healthcare field, I think of Tuskegee experiment. I don't know if folks have heard of the Tuskegee, ooh, Tuskegee experiment, uh, but that is, it was when they uh, in, um, infected 300 black men with syphilis and uh, they didn't allow them to get um, treatment for that. And so that also, that, that affects um, uh, how my, like my family related to the, to the healthcare problem. And that gets passed down generally, generationally uh, to how necessarily uh, I even have some like mistrust of the healthcare field. Also, you can see how it could also be structural, how uh, there's a gross knowledge of like undercovering of LGBTQ topics in um, curriculum. Um, so definitely that's, that's why there's a structural uh, problem of la lack of provider knowledges. Uh, then also there's cultural, so there's implicit biases. We are, we don't exist in a vacuum and we don't, we can't, once we uh, check into work, necessarily take off all of these biases. So we have to think about these unconscious biases and the ways they shape, the ways that we influence and interact with our patients. And I think that by interrogating our own identities and the ways that they uh, interact with each other, we can start to begin to like confront these implicit biases uh, and different uh, privileges and ways that we interact with our patients in healthcare. Um, just to just put one more thing, uh, just to understand that the systems of oppression are interlocking uh, and they take both active forms, which we can see, um, but they also have embedded forms, which our members of dominant groups uh, are taught not to see. Uh, but a lot of times those that are not in the dominant group, we, we see as a way of life and we see as it as, uh, as a fact of life. 
um, well, if we want to re start to redesign these social systems, and I'm sure that everybody in here wants to help, uh, that's usually why we get into these type of fields is we want to help people. Uh, definitely, we want to redesign social systems. We have to acknowledge their unseen di di dimensions. Um, so it's like now that we know about these unseen dimensions, now that we know about identities, uh, what are we going to do with this knowledge? Um, and I think that that's what we're talking about about going forward. So intersectionality and in practice. And well, I'll get to kind of model this. So I'll do this really quick uh, for myself so we can see it before we go into the activity. Um, Aaron, who is Aaron? Uh, these are some of my identities. Um, I'm black, uh, I'm black, uh, and I'm, I'm a native English speaker. I was born in poverty in the South. So that definitely, I was raised by a single, uh, single mother. Um, so in the West End of Will, if y'all are familiar. Um, and it, that definitely has a particular uh, social location and, and uh, and it has affected the way that, not even my standing in just life, but also my understanding of life as well. Uh, neuroadaptive, I mentioned that earlier, uh, with depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, as well as, I, but I am a master's graduate, so I have to acknowledge that I do get some privileges uh, as far as the socioeconomic status because of uh, me being a master's graduate. Uh, I'm queer, and I think that that affects my gender as well as my sexual orientation, uh, as well as being able-bodied. All of these uh, identities affect each other. Um, so I will always, uh, they influence each other the way that um, I was born in poverty, but I um, am a master's graduate, but I'm also black, so I still still experience racism. Uh, so these are the ways that they influence each other. I think, Godi, uh, would you like to do yours too before we go into uh, uh, the yeah. breakout room? And I'm, not, I'm worried that we might not have time for the breakout room, but oh, we'll no. see in a second. Um, um, but for me, so these are some aspects of my identity. Um, so, you know, I am also a native English speaker. I was raised middle class, but in the rural South. Um, I'm queer, I'm trans, I'm fat, and particularly like being raised in rural areas as a fat queer person had its own like particular like disadvantages against me, especially in a family where half of my family was fat, half of my family lived in poverty, um, and that like the the part of my family that lived in poverty were the people who were also fat and experienced healthcare discrimination because of that. And, you know, these are just aspects that we don't talk about. And, you know, for me, being fat is like, like I, I love that part of myself now. And that's a, like, you know, we aren't taught that that is like something that can happen for people. But it like, that is a part of my identity. It's part of my body. My body, like, you know, shapes like shapes itself and grows and sustains me and you know it keeps me alive in here and i'm very glad that it's able to do that and just because its shape might be different than other people's doesn't mean that that is like a a detriment for me um yeah so i won't go into too much detail just because of time um, but those are some aspects of my own identity and they all like, interact with each other. Um, so since we only have about six minutes left, um, what I was thinking, Aaron, is maybe that we just leave this, these questions up on the screen for a couple minutes and let people like, you know, think about the parts of their identity for themselves. And then we can come back together um, and like answer those, uh, the questions that we have um, that we were going to do after the breakout room over the chat. Absolutely. Sounds good. Uh, so just kind of give folks a, like a moment of two to kind of just yeah. reflect on these questions. Mm -hmm. So I think the third and fourth questions are particularly questions like to really examine like right now and after we leave here today. So like how has certain privileges that you have influenced your awareness or the lack of awareness of parts of your identity? You know, cause like for me growing up white, I never really had to think about race in a substantial way. 
um, and as the same way that um, some of my friends did, like on a daily basis. Um, and then as I grew to learn more about white supremacy and racism, anti-blackness, I, you know, learned the ways, all the ways in which, you know, I had perpetuated racism in my life um, without realizing it. And I, you know, that is a lifelong unlearning process for me. Definitely, definitely. Hey, Aaron and Goldie, I um, had a question come to me that I thought, um, folks would really appreciate hearing from you. Yeah. Um, the question was, um, uh, they had never heard the terms neuroadaptive and neurodivergent, and they were wondering um, if you could share more about what that means to you. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so for me, uh, it was really trying to come to, it was trying to, come to uh, the real, the, the acknowledging that I've uh, experienced uh, major depressive disorder, recurrent major depressive disorder for like, um, since I was 16, so like for over almost about half of my life. So it, it, it's been a, it, it, it keeps coming back. So it's, it's a part of my identity, whether I like it or not. Um, and uh, trying to find a term that, uh, that can uh, incorporate that. And I was reading an article that uh, was talking about uh, the depression. Uh, it was an argument that depression, uh, PTSD, anxiety could be the body's way of adapting um, neurologically to uh, different adverse situations or settings. Uh, and I really kind of like, it resonated with me, a neuroadaptive, uh, for me to kind of like ad adopt that as a aspect of my identity. And I love that term neuroadaptive. Um, and it really, I hadn't heard of it until Aaron mentioned it. And, you know, I think that is something I'm going to reflect on and like see if that is a label that fits better than neurodivergent. Um, but what neurodivergent means for me is that, so there's neurodivergent and neurotypical people. Um, so my brain, you know, in some ways produces um, chemicals and has like um, alterations than what we would like consider normal um, or neurotypical people. And, you know, I try to move away from normal language in general because we all have various, you know, different ways of being and there is no really normal. Um, but, you know, living with depression, living with ADHD, um, you know, I've, I've had to navigate life a little differently um, than other folks. Um, but I also think that those parts of myself, particularly with ADHD, like bring me so much more like compassion and energy and like just I'm fun because of that. And so, you know, I love that part of me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the screen. Um, so here we have the evaluation, the tinyurl.com slash LGBT eval. I think Blaze is going to put that in the chat for everybody. Um, so if you all don't mind doing that, and I think at least I, and I'm, I won't speak for Aaron, but at least I am happy to stay here for a little bit and continuing answering questions, particularly around the um, the questions around um, intersectionality and your own identities. Um, and you're welcome to do the evaluation while you're on the Zoom call with us or after, and I'll be sending it out later this afternoon in an email as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I have no problem staying on a little bit later too to answer questions as well. Like we ran out of time, which I hate. So definitely uh, if anybody has any questions that they wanna ask, feel free to ask. Uh, Stay on and ask, or I just type them in the chat room, the chat box yeah. as well. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you all there at our uh, October 22nd session to uh, Black Trans Lab Matter. Oops. So many words of gratitude and thanks and celebration for you, Aaron and Goldie. What an awesome session. Truly incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody that participated and made it what it was. Definitely. Oh, AJ.
Oh, yes. Uh, so I can speak on the identity, uh, Deshandra. Uh, ask uh, if I might speak on the identity, uh, the part of my identity that uh, I mentioned as queer. Uh, yes. So I, um, I, I, I used to identify as gay, but uh, as I've gotten older, I identify as queer more just because it, it can't be necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily easily defined. Um, it can't be boxed in. So, uh, and I think that it, uh, it's my, not only my sexual orientation, but also uh, my gender identity as well, um, that it's just not easily defined. So I, I would I'd probably say I'm non-binary as well. Uh, I'm, I just have not, uh, necessarily come to terms with uh, that term that terminology yet. That was actually something I've talked about uh, uh, with Goldie, like um, as we were as we were coming up with this activity. But uh, just queer is something that I have and just I use it uh, interchangeably for my sexual orientation as well as my gender identity. Hope that answers the uh, question to Chandra. Or to Chandra. That was a good question though, thank you. And I think that, you know, really speaks about like how we're all still, you know, discovering new parts of ourselves and mm -hmm. we're all on this journey. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I feel like I learn, I learn so much every day, uh, not only about myself, but about other people and just the, the human experience and human condition in itself. Um, so definitely with identities, definitely something that's always an ongoing process in learning. Um, so we have a question here from Jacinta. Um, I think I said that right. Um, so curious about the thoughts on how the younger generation com is comfortable with using the word queer addresses um, the older generation who has a completely different experience um, with the word. Um, so for me, um, you know, I queer has also been used as a, you know, as an insult, um, as a derogatory remark towards me as well. Um, it's more about like, as a community, there's been a lot of um, reclaiming of that word. Um, and it's used in academia a lot. And you know, like, you, you'll see like books and classes about like queering just about anything, queering feminism, queering, I mean, I'm sure there's like queering mathematics and queering medicine and um, it's just like getting rid of those boxes. Um, and for me, like queer is an identity for myself. I'm not going to put that on somebody else. Um, like if they are not comfortable with that word, I'm not going to put that on them. Um, but for myself, it's, you know, it's the refusal to be put in a box because my identities are shifting. Um, like both gender and sexual orientation. Um, and so what queer means to me is that I'm not straight, I'm not cis, and you know, it's just constantly moving and flowing. Um, but like I said, I'm not gonna use that term um, to describe somebody else um, who is not, like that is not how they view themselves. Um, but I will use it to describe myself. Yeah, and I, I'll definitely add to, uh, you definitely see a shift um, in the uh, age and generations, uh, because um, uh, older generation uh, LGBT folk, um, you, they they were living in a time, especially when it was used as a, uh, as a pejoratively as a slur. Um, I I have and the younger generations have it, so the younger generations have kind of reclaimed it a little bit. Uh, but I definitely know that uh, older folks do have not reclaimed it. Um, and they don't want to hear it. Um, and I, well, think and I won't is, say all older folks do. No, uh, that, that is. Yeah, it's like there are, there are like, like elders in our community who do use that word and like use it with pride. And, but like, I, I do hear like on the whole, like, you know, um, there might be less people than like our generation, for example. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just kind of what Godi said. Uh, it's just mentioning of, uh, reflecting the language somebody uses to identify for themselves. So just kind of being mindful of it as well. But uh, definitely, it's it, you do see a shift. And I, I think definitely, Jacinta, thank you for that. But that's a good question as well uh, to bring up as far as the different experiences. Um, Shannon said, as someone who identifies as pansexual, I feel using queer allows me to talk about my identity without worrying about erasure or judgment that can come with it, especially being in a hetero appearing relationship. Beautifully said, Shannon. Thank you. Yes. 